we should have talked about the waves for the different types. But anyway, we, uh, we developed the theories of the waves and types. So now we're going to look at what happens to those. So now we know that the wind stress, or particularly the wind stress curve, drives the wind driven jars. But how deep are the wind driven jars? How deep do we feel the effect of the wind stress? And what happens below? Okay. Which is going to be the result of the tunnel situation. And I will look at a simple model. So the Meridian of the Circulation or, or MOC is, uh, is associated mostly with sinking at high latitudes of dense water. Okay. So water for some particular reason becomes dense. So salt is cold and it sinks. And so you start convection at high latitudes. This could be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so high latitudes, mostly in the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean, there is deep convection because the water is very dense, and you start this convection situation, which is going to happen at very uh, deep layers, so below the wind of the jars. So the MOC is used to be called thermohyaline circulation. Okay, so it used to be called a circulation driven by differences in temperature and sinking. So you become dense because you change your sink temperature and you sink to the bottom, and then you start to sort of sink in again. And so it used to be called thermohyaline circulation, but nowadays it's not called thermohyaline circulation anymore because we know that it's not only driven by buoyancy on the ocean. Change in temperature and salinity at the surface through buoyancy flux in the atmosphere. But we know that the wind stress is also driving the meridian of the situation. We know that we know that buoyancy fluxes at the surface are not able to maintain the present day meridian of the situation. Because we will see that in order to balance this sinking of water at high latitudes, you will need a coiling. To bring all the water back to the surface. And in the absence of wind stress, the upwelling is given by some sort of diapiclon and diffusivity. Observations are telling us that diapiclon and diffusivity is not high enough to upwell all the water that is sinking at the high latitudes. And you can see an example here. Okay. So you need some other sort of mechanism to upwell all of this water that has sunk in the high latitudes. And that is wind driven. Uh, which is mostly happening in the southern hemisphere. So we don't call the meridional return situation thermohyaline situation anymore because we know that temperature and salinity changes are not the only drivers of this meridional return situation. If we look at the meridional return situation from a numerical model, it looks something like this. Well, if you find the stick someday, anyway, this is this camera. You know, the first situation is the from a numerical model. So, this is a spin function, okay? This is uh, north, this is south, and here you go from the surface to the bottom. These are streamlines of the uh, stream function. This is a uh, volume transfer in Frederick, 10 to the 6 meter cube per second. And positive means clockwise circulation. And uh, negative means anti clockwise circulation. So you see that in the 
high latitudes, most near the Atlantic. So this is the global meridional electronic circulation. This is just computed in the Atlantic basin. And this is computed in the Indo-Pacific. So you see that the global meridional return circulation at high latitude is same for high latitude and it starts circulating across the equator in the south. And most of this circulation is happening in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, there's nothing. Because in the Pacific, there's no uh, there's no production of deep waters. This water that sinks in the North Atlantic circulates across the equator and then upwells in the latitude of the southern ocean. And then it closes the circulation. So you will see that you see that this this that we call the upper cell is not confined to the equator and there's not much vertical diffusion, vertical diffusion upwelling all this sinking of water back to the surface. Most of these streamlines they upwell in the southern ocean. Some of these streamlines, they close at the equator, but most of this volume of water that has sunk in the northern latitude upwells in the southern ocean through Ekman. So from this, you see already that at least in the numerical model, which is what the reality is, the epigonal diffusion will not be enough to upwell all of this water that is produced in the, uh, in the northern Atlantic. You see in the northern Atlantic that most of this water Crosses the and goes towards the south, where it is well by Then you have a bottom cell, which is not very well reproduced in this model, but you see it. So you have some deep convection in the southern hemisphere and then some anti clockwise circulation below this other cell. And that's the Antarctic bottom water produced in the uh, southern hemisphere. That is sinking in the southern ocean and then fill in the abyss and then upwell again in the southern ocean there is some diffusion between these two cells but most of the water is upwelled again by in the in the southern ocean. then if you look at the pacific you don't have this you don't have much of this deep circulation because there's not much deep water production there is there's supposed to be some Antarctic bottom water, so a deep cell, signature of the deep cell, is very weak in this model, but in reality, there is. And what you see mostly is these two symmetrical uh, cells, very confined to the surface, maximum of 1,000 meters. And these are totally wind driven. Okay? The strong wind stress of the surface at the equator that is driving an ECMA flux away from the equator. At some latitude, this water is abducted and then it is upwelled again at the equator. So you close this cell. Uh, you see this also in the Atlantic, but it's not as strong as in the Pacific because this is zone integrated and the Pacific is much wider than the Atlantic. So there's much more transport in the Pacific than in the Atlantic. But you have it, you have it in the, in the Atlantic. Okay, so the point is that first we're going to see how much, how deep the wind driven gyres go into the, into the ocean. So, how much, how, how deep do you feel the effect of the wind stress and get a scaling of how deep are wind driven gyres? And then, what happens below of these wind driven gyres is going to be some sort of this overturning situation, which is driven by convection latitude and then as a first approximation is going to be vertical diffusion so that we can diffuse and then we will see that in reality that's minor and so we will need to add wind stress to the southern ocean where this water can upper as the surface Okay, so then I can stop showing this. Going to blackboard view. Okay, so 
question. Now we're going to look at how deep does the wind stress go into the ocean? Okay, so when I put a practice when you oh. So we're going to look at the depth of the wind. That is going to be a simple assumptions. So suppose there is next surface warming at low latitude. So the equator, there's net warming, and there's net cooling at high latitudes, so close to the poles. That will generate your meridional temperature gradient at the surface, warming at the equator, colder at high latitudes. If you have this meridional gradient of temperature at the surface, that implies some sort of vertical movement at the equator. So water will rise at the surface at low latitudes, where it's movement, and where it's colder, it will tend to generate a convection cell, which is like this. Okay. So that could be a simple, simple way of looking at the jet radio or the kind of simulation as a uh, convection cell. So here it's warm, here it's cold, and here you will get some sinking, and here you got so warm. And somehow you will have to hold these convections. Starting from the very simple. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor. Yeah. We can't uh, read the, the right part of the blackboard from the, the okay, video. The, 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 the switch. Okay, so can you read from? Yes, yes, yes. It's colder, so denser than the water that is filling the bottom here, that is much warmer. And so through hydrostatic balance, there is a pressure gradient, and there is a meridional flow from the high pressure to the low pressure. 
That's why the water that will sunk, for example, in the North Atlantic will start moving towards the equator and then, and then uh, across the equator, actually, to hydrostatic bodies. So as this water is moving towards the south or equator, let's say this is the equator where it's warm. So as the water is moving, there will be diffusion. Okay, this water will diffuse with the warmer water. And as the water is diffused with warmer water, then it will get lighter and it will tend to rise towards the surface. And so there is, there is going to be a vertical temperature gradient as well through the basin. Okay, so this water will tend to rise to the surface thanks to some vertical diffusion between the cold water in the bottom and the warmer water at the surface. So the very simple argument here is going to be that there is Cool water being diffused with warmer water. And so the cold water sitting at the bottom is going to be diffused with warmer water at the surface. And so there's going to be an advection diffusion. Advection. And this is the idea that was proposed by Monk, again, if you remember Monk, back in the 1966. So he said that the main balance here in this very simple picture of cold water sinking to the bottom and then being vertically diffused with warmer water is that of an advection diffusion process. And so the vertical diffusion process is Going to be something like this. So there's going to be a meridional temperature gradient be between this cold water and this warm water. And a vertical diffusivity coefficient. And so through this vertical diffusivity coefficient, and that is going to diffuse this water, you will generate a vertical velocity. This is just a vacuum diffusion in the vertical. Okay, is the only component that you retain in the advection diffusion balance. So that is going to be the vertical velocity that will upwell this water to the surface. So if this vertical diffusivity is positive because you are upwelling waters, okay, so there's going to be a positive vertical velocity. And that is going to be balanced by a downward diffusivity. So warm water at the surface is going to be diffused into the cold water. And the cold water is rising towards the surface up with some velocity w. And that is going to be the advection diffusion balance. Advection of cold water vertically upward. And diffusion of warm water through this vertical diffusivity downwards. So this advection diffusion balance is what is going to sustain the vertical velocity that will bring this cold water back to the surface through a diffusion process. Okay, so what Munk did is say, okay, if this is the, if this is the main balance, and uh, I neglect horizontal diffusivity. And I assume that the whole Atlantic or Pacific, for example, has a constant vertical diffusivity. Let's take a, uh, from observation, a vertical profile of temperature, get the vertical gradient of temperature and see what the vertical velocity is and what the, the vertical diffusivity is. So if the vertical diffusivity is a constant, and uh, temperature is temperature at the top at e equals zero. 
and temperature is temperature at the bottom. At, at the, the you can solve that equation. And that is going to be, the temperature is going to be the temperature at the top minus the temperature at the bottom. Z omega over KV plus a temperature at the bottom. Then you can set to zero and you simplify your equation. So the temperature will fall exponentially with any folding time scale that is given by KV over omega. Okay, so this is the exponential decay that you can call epsilon. So this is how if you take a profile, your profile of temperature looks like something like this. It falls exponentially given by this advection diffusion balance. And the exponential decay is given by Kv with the long It's just proportional to the um, vertical fusivity and vertical velocity. So what Moon did is bit some observations of temperature and salinity, and he estimated vertical diffusivity. So you can measure you can measure the vertical velocity, you can measure temperature and salinity. So you know the temperature, you know the vertical velocity, and you can estimate vertical diffusivity. If you don't have vertical velocity, you know that in your basin, for example, in the uh, North Atlantic, you have, I don't know, for example, 20 verge of, of water is sinking in the North Atlantic. Uh, the uh, production of deep water is 20 verge, for example. All of those 20 verge, they have to upwell back to the surface, right, to close the circulation. You produce here 20 verge, if you know how much water you are producing, how much deep water you are producing at the high latitudes. You know that you are producing, for example, 20 verge. All of these 20 verge, they have to upwell back to the surface to close the convective cell. So if you, if you, even if you don't know vertical uh, velocity, you know that these 20 verge, they have to go back to the surface. You know the area of the surface, okay, the area of the Atlantic. And so if you, again, consider a constant vertical velocity throughout the basin, you know how much you know how much water you're producing at the high latitudes. You know that all that water has to go back to the surface in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So you divide those 20 verge by the area and you know how much vertical velocity you have into every kilometer squared or whatever. And so you can estimate vertical velocity. How much vertical velocity constant everywhere you need to bring back all those 20 vertebrae. So you know vertical velocity and you know the temperature. So MOOC used a uh, vertical velocity of 10 to the minus 7, okay, which is, if you make the calculations, is roughly what you need to upwell back those 20 vertebrae to the surface. And he got a vertical diffusivity that was roughly 10 to the minus 4. So that is the vertical diffusivity that you need, constant everywhere, to upwell back to the surface those deep waters that you have produced at the high latitudes. And actually, this vertical diffusivity coefficient is too large. Observations say that it's actually 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So this means that if you consider this extremely simple picture with no wind forcing, okay, 
the vertical diffusivity constant everywhere that you need to bring all this water back to the surface is 10 to the minus 4, which is far too large. So you will need some other mechanism to bring all this deep water back to the surface. And that is wind stress upwelling of the southern ocean. So the theoretical value of vertical diffusivity is too large, given the observations. So vertical diffusivity cannot be the only way to bring all this water back to the surface. You will need some other mechanism. If you use 10 to the minus 4, or if you even use, OK, so if you use 10 to the minus 4, you get an epsilon that is roughly uh, 1,000 meters. And if you use this, and if you use KV 10 to the minus 4, uh, no, 100 meters. And if you use 10 to the minus 4, you get something like 1,000 meters, OK, as the e-folding time scale. Now, another point here is that this e-folding time scale can be thought as the depth or the thickness of the thermocline. So this epsilon could be This thickness of the epsilon, where temperature falls and then becomes constant, which, if you remember the definition of a thermocline, if this is temperature and this is depth, this is the mixed layer, okay. and this is the thermocline, right? Then you have the deep ocean where temperature is roughly constant. So this exponential decay that is given by this can be thought as the depth of the thermocline. And can be thought as the depth at which the ocean feels the wind stress. So this, given the observations, is 100 meters is too shallow. 100 meters is the, mix, the mixed layer. And 1,000 meters is more close to actually observations with a vertical diffusivity that is much smaller and closer to observations. Okay, so as a first, as a first idea, you know that with this kind of vertical diffusivity coefficient, which is closer to reality, you get a, an exponential decay of this temperature gradient that is roughly 1,000 meters which is on the order of the depth of the thermal. Okay, so this, this simple idea of Munk that at the beginning was thought as the way to bring back deep waters to the surface was very simple. So you have deep water production at high latitudes. You have to bring back all those uh, that uh, cold water to the surface. And you do that through uniform upwelling by this vertical diffusivity coefficient. And given the observations, he said that the vertical diffusivity required to upwell back to the surface all that uh, deep water produced at high latitudes is 10 to the minus 4. Then observations arrived and, and we realized that 10 to the minus 4, minus 4 is actually too large. Vertical diffusivity is not that large. It's actually 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So vertical diffusivity cannot be the only reason, the only mechanism to bring all this deep water back to the surface. And actually, if you use 10 to the minus 4 as a vertical diffusivity, then you get a depth of a thermocline that is actually too shallow from observation. Okay? So you are quelling vertical diffusivity is too large. Okay. So now let's try to make a, a scaling for the depth of the thermocline from diffusion 
but also from advection. And we will see that diffusion is not enough to explain the depth of the thermal climate, the depth at which the wind stress is not felt by the ocean. We'll start with our uh, momentum equation, the same that we used. Balance with buoyancy. And continuity, okay? And here, buoyancy is so. Let's start with a diffusive scale. Let's just considering diffusivity as we know. So we suppose there is no wind forcing, like before. And the only possible driver of the circulation is this vertical diffusivity. So with this diffusive scaling, we will get a depth of the diffusive thermocline. So a thermocline that is controlled by diffusive processes. So this is one, this is two, and this is three. So if you take the curl of the uh, momentum equations and you use mass continuity, you arrive, like we did many times before, to the Svedru uh, balance and a linear vorticity equation. You take the vertical derivative of the momentum equation and you hydrostasy to obtain the thermal wind. So you obtain from this and using continuity, you obtain again the value balance. Okay. And then taking the vertical derivative of the momentum equation, you obtain W dB by dz. And then you obtain thermal wind. These are all equations that we have already derived, so we need to do it again. Okay. Vector balance, uh, vertical diffusion equation, advection diffusion equation again, as we did, and the thermal wind. Now we make scalings of this. And following the note, how you how to get this, but we did it again and again and again. So we can make scalings of these equations. And remember, there's no wind forcing, there's no friction, and we are using again this advection diffusion balance. Okay, you see. So let's take a scaling of this. And okay, this scaling for the vacuum diffusion equation is going to be some vertical velocity divided by some dz, which is going to be some thickness, some vertical diffusivity over some thickness squared. That is going to be the scaling for the vacuum diffusion equation. Then the scaling for Svedru balance is simply beta u f beta w over some thickness delta. And then for the thermal wind, uh, f some u over delta. It's going to 
going to be equal to some changes in buoyancy over L. So this scaling is the same as the diffusive scaling obtained by Mook. Right. So from this you get that W is okay, is what we did before. Let's just get back to the diffusion scale. But now we have information of the vertical velocity. So uh, from here, okay, we can get okay, for the vertical velocity, which is theta u delta over f, okay, and here this is vertical velocity, and from here we know that u is maybe on a gradient buoyancy. Delta over F. And if you combine these two, you put the U here, you will get a scaling for the vertical velocity, which is theta delta squared delta V over the square L. Okay, just combining the scaling for U into the scaling for vertical velocity. So this is the scaling given by Munch. Okay. Now we have a scaling for vertical velocity. Put this scaling for vertical velocity here, and you will get a scaling for this thickness, which is k x squared l over theta delta b. And if you take the scaling for this thickness delta and you put it into the W, you get a scaling for the vertical velocity, which is this theta over x square L. Just rearranging. So this is giving us scaling for the uh, vertical velocity in this simple vertical advection balance. Okay, it's the same as what Munch did, so advection diffusion, but now using the momentum equation, we can get a scaling for the vertical velocity, which previously he measured. So the vertical velocity is going to be proportional to the gradient in buoyancy, okay? So the temperature gradient, for example, at the surface, that will produce more deep water, and that will need to be balanced by a stronger vertical velocity. So if you take typical values of a subtropical gyre, and you use, for example, a buoyancy gradient of 10 to the minus 2 meter per second squared, and a typical length of a tropical jar 5,000 kilometers, or something like that. F is 10 to the minus 4, and a vertical diffusivity coefficient of, of 10 to the minus 5. With these values, you put these values into this simple scalings. This is just typical values for a subtropical gyre. Then you get a thickness that is on the order of 150 meters, and a vertical velocity that is on the order of 10 to the minus 7. Not surprisingly, the thickness 
is similar to the one given by Munch. And the vertical velocity is similar to the observed one. But now we didn't need to observe the vertical velocity. We arrived to an estimate of the vertical velocity uh, through this case. The problem is that this is similar to the uh, scaling given by Munk, which is too shallow. Right? A thermal climb that is deep, that is 150 meters deep, is too shallow. So, this advection diffusion balance that is trying to explain the thermal climb or the depth at which the ocean fills the wind stress. Is given me, and so this is where this is where the ocean fills the wind stress. This is the top, which I have curl, and this is felt down to a certain thickness, which is roughly the thickness of the thermal. So this simple scaling, which is a diffusive scaling, okay, there is no there's no wind stress. The only thing that is balancing here, vertical velocity, is vertical diffusivity. So this simple scaling is giving me a thickness of the thermal climb, which is unnatural. So diffusion is not enough, as we know already. Okay. So actually, observed values for ECMAP pumpings, if you look at the figures that I, that I showed you before, if you look at typical values for Ekman pumping, so this vertical velocity is Ekman function, vertical velocity. Um, so typical value for W actually from observation vertical velocity is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So larger than this. Okay, so this this scaling is not is not fitting your position. Okay, so just diffusive scaling is not fitting your position. And the thermal plane is obviously not this shallow. Okay, so there's something missing, and that is going to be uh, direction. So we, here we have a balance between vertical velocity and vertical diffusion. And that balance, that only balance, is not sufficient to explain the depth of the thermal. It is giving the thermal one that is too short, and a vertical velocity that is too short. So we are going to need an advective scale. Okay, we're going to need a vacuum, but also helps bringing all this deep water back. Okay, so we're going to add a vertical velocity that is the one given by the wind stress. That is going to be this Ekman pump. Okay, so the assumption is that we have both the attraction diffusion balance and a vertical velocity given by the Ekman pump that is trying to push down the thermal. Okay? So Ekman pumping at the base of the uh, Mix layer. In a subtropical gyre is actually directed downwards. So vertical velocity is pushing down into the ocean interior and it's transmitting momentum into the ocean interior. And that is deepening the thermal climb. 
And then we will have a diffusive balance that is trying to push the thermocline through this vertical velocity upwards, balanced by vertical velocity downwards. So the idea is that you have this vertical velocity balanced by vertical diffusivity, and you have the ECMA pumping velocity. So at some point, these two velocities are going to be zero. They're going to compensate each other. And so at some level, vertical velocity is going to be zero. And this is going to be the new depth D of the thermocline. So now we have both the adaption and diffusion balance, but we're also introducing the ECMA pumping velocity. So ECMA pumping velocity is pushing down in the diffusive, in the adaption diffusive balance, vertical velocity is upward. And so we assume that at some level, these two vertical velocities that are, are opposing each other will induce a vertical velocity that is equal to zero, where one is equal to the other. And they cancel to that level there will be a balance and at that level that will be the depth of the thermal. so imagine imagine that you have the same thing as before where you have a vaction diffusion okay and the thermal is very shallow 150 meters or so then you switch on the wind and by switching on the wind you generate this atmon pumping okay vertical velocity downwards that is pushing down the thermal and it will push down the thermocline against this advection diffusion balance. And it will, at some point, this pushing down by ECMO pumping will stop because the force exerted by the ECMO pumping will be equal to the force exerted by the vertical velocity and by the advection diffusion. And so at some point, it will find a balance where these two oppose each other. And that will be the stable Again, this vertical balance, where now the W is now this W is the echo pump, okay, what we always need, and thermal wind. So the scaling of this, as we saw before. This is now the aircon pumping. Okay. Now this this thickness Bz is this new D depth of the thermal. Okay, if you combine these two scalings, okay, much simpler than before, you get a D that is square L over This is the new scaling for the depth of the thermal point, where now W is the F. So now what we really care about is Ekman pumping, transmitting momentum into the ocean interior until a certain level. And that will be the depth of the influence of the wind stress. Below the depth, the ocean doesn't feel the wind stress. And that could be thought as the depth of the wind drift drops.
So obviously, the depth of the uh, wind-driven gyro or the depth of the thermocline is proportional to the Whistler's curl. Okay, vertical velocity of Ekman is proportional to the Whistler's curl. So the larger the Whistler's curl, the deeper the wind-driven gyro. And decreases with the meridional temperature gradient okay. because if you have a larger temperature gradient, you have a larger thermal wind shear. Okay, the number of thermal wind shear. Larger thermal wind gradient, larger thermal wind shear. But the transport has to be the same. So in order to conserve mass, you have to decrease. The section given the larger temperature gradient, the shear is larger, and so given that the transport is the same, all that transport will be in a shallow area, and so depth decreases the resistance. So the larger the temperature gradient, the deeper the depth of the wind, and the stronger the resistance curve. The deeper the wind driven gyre becomes. So now you can put uh, estimates of observed estimates of the uh, maximum pumping velocities, which are on the order of 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the minus six. And given typical values for F, L, beta, and meridional gradient of buoyancy, we can get a scaling for the convective scaling for the depth of the wind driven jar. And you will see that D is on the order of a thousand meters, which is much closer to. Obviously, this is a simple scaling, just giving you an idea of the order of magnitude of the depth of the wind and jar. But this is telling you basically how deep it should be. The idea is that the wind driven jar is a very upper ocean phenomenon, right? So, maximum 500 meters, 1000 meters, which is the depth of the thermocline. This is on the order of a thousand meters at most. Okay. So that is the wind driven jar and the depth of the wind movements. Below this depth, that depth, the ocean is not caused by the winds, or at least not in the same way. And below there will be a different situation. So the wind driven jar that we've been talking about, the interiors that you transport, the western boundary currents, and all that. Is confined the first 500 to 1000 meters because that is the depth of which the ocean feels the ocean. The, the so, at the points the wind influence scaling D is the depth to which the directly wind driven circulation is expected to penetrate into the ocean interior. Over this depth D, the dynamics is that of wind driven gyres. And below this depth D, we have an abyssal circulation that is not directly driven by the wind stress. It is somehow directed by the wind stress because we saw that vertical diffusivity is not enough to up well back all the, uh, all the water that subducts in the northern altitude. Okay? But we also need Ekman actuality in the southern ocean. So it is somehow driven by the winds as well, but not directly. And so, okay, so now, now we're gonna construct a very simple model for this circulation, okay? This abyssal circulation. So this is the wind driven gyres. 
that we have talked about for many days. And that is roughly the depth of the winter and This is roughly the depth of the winter and Below that depth, there is an abyssal situation. And we can build a very simple model of the abyssal situation. It's not going to be uh, extremely realistic, but it will give us some key concept of how the abyssal situation works that are actually correct. Okay, not the exact numbers, not the details, but the uh, key points and the key ingredients of the uh, abyssal situation. And our model is going to be very simple. Okay, we're going to have a surface, we're going to have a bottom. We are going to have a uh, sinking at high latitude. Okay, this is north and this is the crater. And then we're going to have uniform upwelling from the abyssal ocean to the upper ocean. And uniform upwelling through a uniform vertical diffusion. So we're going back to the idea of Monkov vertical diffusion. We're not including, of course, the effect of the wind stress yet. That is happening in the southern hemisphere. The southern ocean. So let's just talk about vertical diffusion. How you can balance all this water that is sinking at the high latitude and that has to work well back to the surface. So we start with the same uh, the physical equation that we prefer to balance in that framework. So we assume the same momentum equation as always, and we arrive to the uh, Virgil balance equation. So in this simple model here, the vertical velocity at the bottom is equal to zero, of course, and then we have a vertical velocity that is balancing all that water that is sinking at the high latitude. And through the advection diffusion balance, vertical diffusivity induces this vertical velocity. Okay, just like in the middle. So this vertical velocity is positive, right? Because it has to bring all this cold water back to the surface. And vertical velocity is equal to zero at the bottom. So this is going to be vertical velocity zero at the bottom. So BV is F W naught or W top over the depth h of the uh, abyss, this depth. So w top, or just click on it, is uniform because vertical diffusivity is uniform and is directed upwards. And so if this is uniform and positive, it means that V is also positive. Okay. So the meridional velocity is going to be positive. Okay. So this vorticity balance, remember that we said that the water that falls at the bottom is denser than the same water at the same level at the because it's colder, so it's denser. And so through hydrostatic balance, this water goes towards the equator by hydrostatic balance. Now we know that the water at the surface through this vorticity balance, because vertical velocity is positive, induces the meridional velocity that is also positive. And so now 
we know why and what connections are these groups. Just a more basically balanced approach. Okay, so now we have a forward vertical velocity at the surface, which you can think of as the uh, the surface branch of the meridian of the currency. Okay, so this is the, the lower branch of the meridian of the currency collection at the surface. You have water that is returning towards the poles. Okay. So you have just stopping balance, which is giving you the one over F. Dx. Okay, the geostrophic velocity. This B is my meridional component of the geostrophic velocity. And so now I can compute the pressure. So pressure is going to be. So XE is the uh, eastern border of this simple model. You can integrate that's good. And uh, so here you can write B as H. Pressure side is squared W over H integrating zone. Okay. So that's going to be my pressure. And because the vertical velocity is constant. This is the expression of the pressure. Where we have assumed that pressure is assuming pressure is equal to zero at x. Okay, that's the expression for. The pressure into the simple basis. Okay, so that's the expression for pressure that we got from Sledger balance and the Mediona component. Now you take the zero momentum, the zero component of the geostrophic velocity, okay, my zone of geostrophic velocity, and you plug in the expression for pressure. Just put it in the pressure. And if you do the d by dy of f in the bigger plane, okay. so f by dy theta and cos d theta by dy. Then U is Q over H W. So 
Okay, so that's my zonal component of the dystrophic phase. Now, this is also telling me if I start from x e minus x that my zonal velocity is also positive. So imagine that if you're looking from the top, so this is x is zero and x e is one, you know dimensionally. Okay. So u is also positive. Okay. Vertical velocity is positive. And so the result, the zonal component of the dystrophic velocity is also positive. And is in this simple case is independent of a okay, so is independent of the last two. So this simple model says the zonal, the zonal uh, component of the dystrophic velocity from the western boundary towards the east is constant. Of course, it's multiplication. So what we have so far, okay, so far we have. Sinking a high latitude, uniform upwelling. This uniform upwelling positive is giving me a meridional velocity towards the north. And then we just found that we have a zonal component of this dystrophic velocity that is also positive and independent of last year. Stop me if I'm making a mess with the diagram and with the explanation. So imagine if this if this is the Atlantic Ocean, imagine that you have this vertical velocity, this meridional velocity going towards the north, okay, this B induced by the vertical velocity. Okay, so B is going towards the pole. And at the same time, from the western boundary, there is this zone of velocity that is also positive into the basin. So if you put U and V together, the zonal and the meridional component, you have this zonal velocity positive and this meridional component positive. So you have something like this. Yes, because V is positive and U is also positive. So this is how you are balancing in this simple case the deep water production of the um, of the north. So there is a lot of water sinking here. There is vertical uh, upwelling of water by attraction and fusion, and there is a returning flow. Of this upwell water back towards the region where the water is sinking. Okay? So, with this simple scalings and simple equations, how we conserve the mass, we can go to the continuity equation. U by dx plus v by dy plus. Okay, we have an expression for the vertical velocity that is induced by diffusivity. We have v. That is induced by this vertical velocity, and we have u that is the dystrophic velocity given by this pressure. If you put all those terms together, the d by dx of u, the d by dy of v, and d by dwz, right? So we have d by dx of U, U over H, W, X, E minus X, yes, plus the V by the Y of V, and V is F, W over H. Okay. Plus. 
the D varies at a vertical velocity, which is W at the top and zero at the bottom. Okay. Uh, this is minus Q over H W. Okay, because X is Q uh, plus W over H, who is very wide, plus W over H. Okay, just do the everybody one of this and you will get W over H. Uh, and well, this is twice this. So this is. So we are conserving mass in this simple model. So this is the idea, okay? And now we're gonna make it even fancier and explain the circulations. Can you? It's only the nodes anyway. Okay, so now let's make, with this model, let's make a model of the nodal graph. This is the equator. This is north, of course. We have a region of deep water production, okay, which is going to be called source, the source of deep water, okay, which is in the Labrador Sea, the North Atlantic. And this source of deep water is going to be balanced by that uniform upwelling. Okay. What we did before. The interior flow is going to be northwards. We know that P is to the north. And the zone of velocity U is positive. Okay, is the uh, conclusions that we reached so far. Now think about the uh, wind-driven gyres. We have this surface forward velocity, production of deep water, so sinking, which is going then towards the equator by hydrostatic balance. As a deep flow. And that's, that deep flow, if you think about the wind driven gyres, why are the wind driven gyres, why do wind driven gyres have a western boundary current? Because of beta, right? So, western, the, the boundary current is, is on the west because of beta. And then diffusivity balances the result. So if I have now this deep water production, the source that is sinking the water, that then travels towards the equator, then is upwell by a constant vertical velocity. And that upwell water is going back to the source with this point. Now think about what is happening here below. The sinking of water that is traveling towards the equator, is it going to travel in the center of the uh, simple basin, everywhere in the basin, or because of beta, there is going to be in the west. The beta is going to be like the western boundary current. Because of beta is going to be squashed on the west. 
water. So when the water sinks, it doesn't go through the ocean in the middle of the ocean, but it actually sinks and goes on the west as a deep western boundary current. And then this deep western boundary current is uniformly up well to the surface by that vertical velocity. And once the water is up well uniformly to the surface, it returns to the sinking region with this just dropping velocity. So actually, now if you think about this is happening below the wind-driven gyres, right? And in the wind-driven gyre, you have a western boundary current that flows northwards. And below the wind-driven gyre, you have a western boundary current that flows towards the equator. Okay? They are opposing each other. So below the Gulf Stream, there is a deep western boundary current that goes from the north towards the equator. That is part of this of what we see. Okay, this is still a simple laboratory uh, model, but it's actually quite accurate. Well, qualitatively explaining what is happening. <clears throat> so we take a latitude, whatever, y. Okay, you can put this latitude y, whatever you want. We just need to put some latitude. So we take some latitude and we look at the conservation of mass, okay? So there is going to be a source plus an interior transport that depends on latitude, okay? And that is balanced by a transport by this western boundary current that depends on latitude. And an upwelling that also depends on that. And all that has to be equal to zero. Okay. So we have S, which is the source, how much water. Then TI is the transport in the interior. Okay, so this TI, all work of this latitude, whatever the latitude. TW is the uh, transport towards the equator at the bottom. And U is the uh, loss of mass by the upwelling. All of this have to balance. You produce some water, the source, that is replenished by this interior transport. And that is balanced by this transport on the western side that takes away this source water. And you're also losing mass by this upwelling of water. So that is going to be good to zero. North of some latitude y, you can put y here, you can put it here, you can put it at the equator. Okay, it's just an integrated area balance of sources and sinks. Okay. okay, so if you use this value balance again, F over theta, W over H, right? Okay. Value balance. What is the I? All work of some latitude y. You can integrate that from x to x. This is the transport through a section. So the transport, the interior transport is going to be this v times the height h integrated over the length x. So this is going to mean the area times the velocity that's my transport through the section. The section at some latitude y here, okay? How much transport is passing through this? You can put the expression for the uh, velocity mean, and that is f over theta w h over a. Okay. 
that's the value of the interior form. Okay, so we have one term. How much do I lose by upwelling this U term that is upwelled by that constant relative velocity? How much water do I lose by upwelling is going to be the surface area integrated over X to Y okay? because it's uniformly, uniformly upwelling in this area from X west to X east and from this Y. To the security okay. So here I am uniformly upwelling mass by this term. So I have to integrate from x to x west and from this large y that could be anywhere to what to the latitude avenue. And that is upwelled by my vertical velocity w constant everywhere. That's how much mass I am losing by from one to the other. And this is simply u times x plus y more minus. This is the mass that I am losing by upwelling this term. And I have the interior transport as well. So now we can estimate the transport of the western mass. The transport of the western boundary is a function of y is going to be S plus the transfer of interior minus what I'm losing by a point, right? So the source plus transfer of interior, which is this, over eta W X minus then how much I'm losing by upwelling? Minus minus one. So this is the expression for the western boundary transfer. Given a source and an interior transport, which is given by the angiostrophic meridional velocity. And how much I lose by upwelling over the end. But of course, we always have to maintain mass balance. Okay. So, what, how much water I produce by the source will have to be upwelled by the uniform vertical velocity. So all the water that I produce as X source will have to be equal to the vertical velocity times the area. So I produce some dense water that goes to the bottom. The same amount of water will have to come back uniformly over this area with some vertical velocity. So that will maintain a mass balance. Okay. Okay. Y at the north minus Y at the south, whatever Y, whatever Y you choose. So over that area, how much water you produce will have to come back up. So the strength of the western boundary transport. Small. Okay, so I can write the strength 
plus s plus I move that I move this is my x minus x and I leave this as y n over minus one okay because I'm looking at this mass balance at some latitude y I can, I can put this latitude y where I want I can put it at y south but I could put it here just trying to make this as general as So we now know that source is equal to that. So the source is equal to three dx y north minus y south. Okay, we got the y plus f over beta w over x minus what I lose by upwelling over this area, delta x, y north, minus y. So I just substituted s by this mass concentration. So that my transfer at the western boundary current, if you rearrange this with this dx, dx, dx. dx y minus y south plus f okay, just rearranging those three terms so over of this latitude y and again i can put this latitude where i want The mass source S plus the power mass flux TI are equal to the source of the uh, mass flux towards the equator by the transport and the loss to what one. Forward or some okay. So basically, imagine maybe I should have drawn a different maybe not. This is where I have my source, yes. okay. and this is my latitude y. So this is that. So this. And this is the section at some latitude y. So this continues. And this is a latitude y. Okay. And I'm looking at this section here. Okay, it's like <laughs> capital here on latitude y. You know what I'm trying to draw? This is latitude y, okay, and I'm cutting through here, and this is what I'm looking at. So the basin continues, but I'm doing a mass balance at latitude y, how much goes in and how much goes out, okay? So forward of this latitude y is a mass source s, okay? Plus the forward mass flux across the y, which is T interior, right? T interior, 
that is going north across this section at latitude y. So I have mass produced by S that is entering the abyss. And I also have the interior that is entering through the section. And that is balanced by the Western boundary transport that is towards the equator. Okay. And what I lose by a quality. Okay. So what I also lose by well in you, I don't know how to on this area here. Is maybe I made a mess, but I'm fine. Okay, so the mass bar of this section Y, so you have an input source mass S and an interior transport towards the north across the section, which is positive. And how much mass do I lose in this piece of cake? Transport towards the equator by the western boundary current and up by the way. Okay, so this is the abyss. Okay, this is a piece of cake in the abyss. So I have an input of mass by S, an input of mass through this section of that Y by the interior transport, and I lose mass by unit of welding over the area and western boundary current. So this, this is what we do in Atlantic. And so my equator in my simple model is Y sum. So I can put, I can put in this simple model Y south equal to zero. Next is zero to zero. And so the Western boundary transport that is going to be the zero in the Y. And so the Western, Western boundary transport is the X. Y plus over F is F not plus Y. So the transport of the Western boundary current is W X Y plus F not. Okay, so this is that of the X, the Y plus F not. And uh, we said that this is the equator. And so we can put our F naught at the equator. Remember the beta plane is 
F naught and then beta is more variations of F. So we can put F naught, the center of our beta plane at the equation, so that F naught is equal to zero. So the transport of the western boundary current is here at this Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm going to stick here. Okay, so I have W is the X. And I have F is not the two. So that was correct. So Y. Beta y plus f naught. Okay. I can divide by beta. X is two y plus f naught. Okay. Sorry. It wasn't a mistake. I, I just need to rearrange things like this. Okay, so we are here. Okay, I set ys at the equator, and that's going to be my zero in y. So this is the transfer of the western boundary. F is on the beta plane, so F is at not y's beta y. So two beta y plus f which is the same divided by beta, 2y plus f naught. Now I can set f naught at the equator, because that is going to be the equator. So the beta plane is going to be center at the equator. And if it is center at the equator, f naught is equal to zero. So the transfer at the western boundary is going to be two so that's two that's why Tell me the name state, I don't think so. Um, two omega y plus y. Yes, and, and this, I deleted it, but this is S. Remember by mass continuity, S was equal to, had to be equal to the vertical velocity integrated over the area. So, From from y zero to uh, I'm making a mess. Okay, now I'm going like this. The source was equal to omega two x 
delta x delta y. So y north minus ys. But ys we said is equal to zero. So y north. So now I've okay, so the vertical velocity is s the source over dx y north. So now I put this into the transfer of the resting bundle, which is root s over dx y north times dx y. Okay. Like this. So the transport as a function of attitude. To s y over y naught. Now this is interesting because you can look at the western boundary transport at the north where you have the source. So you can set y equal y north. Okay, so you can set this y here. Why not? And look at what is the western boundary transport at y north. It's one, so at y equal y north is equal to twice the source. So the transport at the western boundary current at the north is twice the source. So at the northern boundary, the equator of a transport is twice the source. The western boundary current is towards the equator at the current. And so if this is twice, remember that this is S plus T interior minus T uh, minus some U. So if this is twice the source, then we will see what is the i. The i will have to be proportional to s squared. So at y north, the i was f over theta w delta x. And if you put the expression for s, f over theta, s over y naught x times dx, which goes away. And so, This is theta y n over theta x over y n. So just that's of course up y north, yeah, well in zero. So if this is twice the source, the interior transport will have to be equal to the source. So F again is the beta plane F naught plus beta Y, but F naught is equal to zero. So. Okay, so this is the only way you can balance mass. So at the north, you will have source 
the western boundary transfer is going to be twice the source. So that's because the interior transfer is equal to the source. So this is equal to the source plus the source balanced by western boundary transfer, which is twice the source. As the western boundary transport travels to towards the equator, it is diffusedly upwell towards the surface and makes this inferior transport towards the surface. Okay, let's make this. So what I've been trying to show is This. Okay, we have this simple, simple model, some source, some interior transport through a section of Y, up well and everywhere, in a western boundary current towards the equator. That's simply starting from a source and uniform upwelling everywhere. We reached our conclusion that this uniform upwelling produces this interior transport towards the pole and mass, sorry, mass balance requires a western boundary transport towards the equator. And so this simple model predicts a western boundary, a deep western boundary returning all this, well, bringing all this source water towards the plate, and then uniform. Okay, so what I was trying to show here is this. Okay? So we have a source, all the water at the bottom goes as a western boundary current towards the equator, and there is uniform upwelling with some U positive and some V that takes the water back to the source. And some upwelling everywhere, uniform. At Y latitude, the Western Mountain transfer is twice the source because at Y latitude, we have the source plus the interior transfer, which I think. So that gives me twice the Western Mountain transfer. And as the Western boundary transport travels towards the equator, it is uniformly up well to the surface. But that kappa v vertical is zero. Okay, so this is an even nicer way of visualizing what is happening. Okay, the source, Western boundary current that is uniformly up well to the surface. U is positive and V is positive. So the velocity goes like this as an interior transport back to the source. Okay. This simple model, so the, the actual first way they look at this simple model is in a laboratory model. Okay. So this is a rotating disk with this triangular shape that is trying to mimic the North Atlantic. So they put some dark stomach and hours, as long as the same people, no one can stop them. They were two ocean hours in the same thing. They did everything. Uh, a source at the uh, north of this triangle that is rotating on a bigger plane. So you put some dye here, and you see that the dye, which is denser fluid than the ambient fluid, falls to the bottom. As the disk is rotating, 
close to the bottom, and that is washed to the west because of heat. And it starts circulating towards the equator in this laboratory towards the heat. And as it goes to, towards the equator, it is uniformly upwelled by some diffusivity that is controlled in the water. So you see how the black shadow is filling the, uh, the this triangle of the thing, and is upwelling towards the surface and it's slowly, slowly filling the surface. So it's upwelled slowly, uniformly, and then producing this velocity back towards the surface. Now you might think well, this is nothing to do with reality. Actually, yes, okay, there's a lot of in common with reality, not the details, but the main thing. For example, this is one of the few things, this is one of the few times when a theoretical study, okay, with a very simple model and a laboratory model to show this single situation. This simple theoretical study predicted a major ocean current, the deep western boundary current. This deep western boundary current towards the west that is required for mass balance was predicted by this simple model of Stonewall and Alice. And later, after 20 years or so, that deep western boundary current was actually observed. People didn't know it existed. They, Stonewall and Arrows, they said in this simple theoretical and lab model, we require a deep western boundary transfer to balance the mass. And after 20 years, they went to the North Atlantic and they found a deep western boundary current below the Gulf Stream. So you can put more than one source and not a triangle, but a more realistic shape. And if you put a source here, like in the, in the previous example, you have a source, a deep western boundary current, and then slowly upwelling back to the source. And you can put sources in the Southern Ocean where you have production of and using the same argument, you can make this more simple, more global, more realistic, but I find it very difficult to understand myself. But basically, you can put more sources, and with the same few ingredients, you can get the major features of the abyssal situation, meaning source, a deep western boundary current, and uniform up. But we know that uniform upwelling is not enough because in this case, the uniform upwelling that you need to mass to balance mass is much larger than the other. But this model is nevertheless very useful because it predicts a deep western boundary current and it predicts a recirculation production of deep water in the source region, deep western boundary current, upwelling back to the surface, and interior transport back to the surface. In reality, this upwelling, this upwelling strength given by a vertical diffusivity is not as large to balance the source. So we will need some other way of thinking about the source. So wait, it's 11. Sorry. So we, we can pause now for half an hour and then, then we'll meet again. Actually, okay, sorry. This is observation, very nice. Okay, observation, um, oxygen, so concentration of oxygen, uh, dark colors means a lot and yellow colors means not that much. Observe oxygen concentration on a surface of gamma 28 with this uh, potential density, some level at the bottom. It's not actually at depth, but it's a layer of constant density which is at the bottom. When do you have high concentration of oxygen? When the ocean was in contact with the atmosphere and is breathing through the atmosphere. So we have high concentration of oxygen at the surface. So a high concentration of oxygen at the surface here in the North Atlantic, then that water with a lot of oxygen sinks to the bottom, bringing the oxygen with it. And so you can trace that water mass through the oxygen concentration. So you will see that here at the bottom of the ocean, you have this mass of water with a lot of oxygen because it was recently in contact with the atmosphere that is flowing at the bottom on the western side. 
So this is the uh, deep western boundary that is predicted by this simple model okay? that you can trace by the oxygen. And you see that is slowly filling the ocean. Okay? There's some colors. But most of this is crossing the equator. So some is diffused, but not as much. So a lot of this Western boundary kind of crosses the equator. So we will need some form of bringing this water back to the surface. And I'll see you in half an hour to continue. Thank mm -hmm. you. 